I'll start with you, Lydia. So, 1988, you summited Everest, uh, the first woman to do so, the youngest New Zealander, the first female in New Zealand to do that as well, uh, without supplementary oxygen. You get, you get back down and one could expect that, you know, you're going to be greeted with celebration and, and applause, but that wasn't really the case. Can no. you tell, tell us what happened? <laughs> it was quite a tough time. Uh, we were a joint expedition, and because of a storm that I missed, 50% uh, uh, of my expedition died. They were foreigners, but they were foreigners. And uh, then I got down, and the other New Zealand people, who included Rob Hall of the famous Everest movie, um, had said that I wasn't, uh, I was lying that I'd summited Everest. And I always really struggled with uh, asking exactly why, except that I did sleep with the right people. And, <laughs> and, um, and, but, you know, when hashtag me too came out, that was really easy because it was just simple. It was really just simple bullying. But aside, it was a hard, it was a dark time. You know, it was the hardest time I'd ever done and the biggest risk I'd ever taken, um, and uh, the best expedition I'd ever been on until that turning point to come back to uh, Kathmandu in Nepal and to find that I was labelled a liar in the world. So they had gone to the media effectively and spread that around? Oh, they were super clever with the media, and I was aware of that skill, uh, had I started arguing enormously, then I would have lost, you know, because I was a wild child, you know, I had blonde dreadlocks, <laughs> when people would come up to you and said, say, how do you get your hair like that? Seriously, <laughs> rasta pasta, all that. And, uh, and, yeah, I was kind of a wild child, so it was an easy, an, an easy uh, target. And, uh, but... What was the other thing is that, of course, in, in Nepal and Pakistan and these in, in those Asian countries with the big, big mountains, you have to get a permit from the government, and the government actually holds your passport, and they say, yes, we believe you summited all. No, we didn't. And they punish you if you are on a route without a permit, which, to add a little je ne sais quoi, I was. <laughs> <laughs> and so how did you deal with all of that? Oh, I went down, I went quiet. I waited until my punishment came out from the Nepal government, which was incredibly mild and super, 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 the, the lightest punishment they'd ever given out to anybody, which was kind of like saying, hey, we understand there's some stuff going on. And then I, uh, took me a long time to get back into mountaineering, you know, a dark period of being told that you were a fool or you were a liar, and then slowly uh, climbing historians around the world, not Aotea from Aotearoa, but from other countries, did a whole lot of research and it was pretty much decided, or agreed, if you like, that I had indeed, well, I was telling the truth. Me, I'll move on to you. You're, you're a world bantamweight champion, domestic violence survivor. Yeah. Initially, you stayed away from boxing because it was something that you associated with your ex. So... At what point did you, decide, did you decide to turn to it, and why at that point? I, I actually didn't want to turn to it. Yeah. I just finished having my fifth child, and I felt very low self-esteem about myself, and I thought, okay, I need to do some fitness. So I just pl posted it on Facebook, and my coach at, that is now, um, Isaac, messaged me, like, come down to the gym, come do some training. And so I was like, I didn't want to, but then something in my brain just said, okay, I'll just do it. So I went down, just thinking that I'm going down to do it for fitness, and I get there and walk through the doors with my two babies, and he's like, okay, you're training to be a professional boxer. And I was like, no, I'm not. I'm not. And then you get fit. Yeah. And I was like, I just had a baby, like, three months ago, so I'm not. I only came here to do fitness. And he was like, nah, you're going to be, you're, you're really good at boxing. I see something special in you. And I was like, you're joking, right? And he was like, 
you're going to be the next world champion. And I was like, you haven't even seen me box. Like, <laughs> why would you even think that? I was like, you know I'm a pitter patter. And I was scared of professional boxing. Like amateur, I was really confident because it was just like about points. But professional was more about power and speed. It just, and it was hard work. So I, I was very scared. Mm. And my ex at the time, he, he did it as well. And I didn't like it, so I hated it. Yeah. So I was kind of like, mm, I was very undecided. So I just, get, I, I just listened to my coach, Isaac, and I just gave it a go. And as soon as I hit that ring, like the first, the first blowing punch, I was like, is this it? <laughs> like, I was really like, come on, let's go. Come on, let's go to war. Because I was like, I was shocked because it was all about power, but I, was, I didn't realise that the ability I had like power for you, actually. Yeah, so power putting, for me. Putting the power back in your hands, yeah. which you hadn't had for a long time. No, because I had any. no control. For yeah. 10 years, I, was, I just listened to my abuser and I let him control my life because I didn't know any way because I was just so young and I was so vulnerable. The, he was the only one that I thought could teach me how to live and I thought that was normal because I didn't know what normal was because I grew up in such a loving family and like having that and then seeing his family, I thought that was normal. And being so young and gullible, mm. I'll admit it, I was, I was gullible and young, mm. but I also learnt and it taught me how to grow and I took control back as soon as I went back to that ring. We, with your two stories, we're talking about you know, overcoming adversity and these big challenges. Uh, and and also, you know, figuring out how to sort of pick your life back up and, and keep moving. Holly, you were born with a limb reduction. You've yep. been doing sports since you're about four. So it's sort of like the only life you've ever known. Yeah. So when when you talk about when people talk about adversity and overcoming challenges, do you even see it that way? Because if you were born, you know, the, if you were born this way, mm. do you even describe it as adversity or a challenge? Oh, look, I, I don't think I would nowadays. Like, I don't view myself in, any different to anybody else. But I was born without my arms, so I sort of know no difference. But growing up, and particularly in my younger years, there was no one around me who looked like me. <laughs> I think I met my first um, amputee friend when I was, like, 15. And so it's the first person I actually had met that was like me. So I was like, whoa, there's actually someone else with a prosthetic hand in the world. Um, and that was pretty crazy. But... Particularly when I was younger, that judgment and assumptions from others was what really held me back a little bit. Um, and I always actually remember my first prosthetic hand was something my parents thought, hey, this will be great for her, we'll get her this hand, and made me feel different from everybody else because I needed something to help me to fit in with the world around me. And so I actually came up with all these plans to get rid of this prosthetic hand because I hated it. <laughs> I absolutely hated it, and I tried all these plans um, until what, one day... What kind of plans? Like, just to get rid of it. Just to hide it. What, I stash it, it somewhere? Yeah, stash it somewhere. <laughs> so I actually stashed it in the backyard of our house. I um, oh buried gosh. it in the pumpkin patch. And <laughs> honestly, there's still a prosthetic hand there to this day. <laughs> <laughs> I said I would not tell my parents where I hid that prosthetic hand because even though they thought they were doing the right thing for me, I felt that I needed something else to help me fit in with the world around me. Mm. Um, so that was a challenge growing up, but then I found sport, and I found this goal, this drive, this um, commitment to something that I really enjoyed and that I was really, really good at, um, and I loved that, and I was like, hey, let's go. Like, I got identified at the age of 12, and someone said to me, hey, you could be a future Paralympian, and it was something I'd never, ever thought about before. And I thought, okay, let's have a go, and I went off to my first World Champs at 16, and and here I am still to this day attending, just got back from the World Champs recently um, and off to Paris next year as well. So, yeah. Wow. yeah. Congratulations. <laughs> <laughs> I'll stay with you, Holly. In terms of in Paris sports, yep. well, actually just sports between men and women, women are treated very differently, and yep. that's from the funding, the exposure, to the way that it's reported in the media, so headlines. Uh, a, lot, a lot of the time with women, it's about their personal lives. Yeah, or, absolutely. You know, not just focusing on the sporting achievements. Yep. Do you feel that, and how do you 
I guess, how do you deal with that? And then also, sorry, there's like three questions in one, also the difference between how Paralympians are treated mm. to Olympians even. Yeah, yeah, mm. absolutely. So the first part of your question, one of the most common questions I get asked when I'm doing media is when are you going to have kids? Like, it's like a ticking time bomb. It's like, hey, when are you going to retire to have kids? And you're like, hey, like, chill out. Yeah. Like, <laughs> I'm only 28. Like, I'll get there when I want to get there. Yeah. Um, but I think when it comes to that sort of thing, you have to use your voice in educating people that it's not okay to ask those questions. You're not going to ask an all-black that question, right? Mm. Um, which seems pretty crazy, but quite often you'll see in media as well, our ages of females are usually in the, in the print pretty clearly, but males usually not. Mm. Um, so that's pretty crazy. But within Paris sport, there has been a big difference as well. I came into the sport when Paris sport was separate from our able-bodied counterparts in all things. Things. So that was at an organisational level and a com competition level. Uh, that changed in 2012 when para-athletics was fully integrated with Athletics New Zealand, which was incredible. Um, and then we had our first joint uh, training camp pr prior to the London Olympics in 2012, which was a stepping stone for us. Mm. Um, and I've been really proud to see that change and be one of the people that have used my voice for um, Paris sport and making sure those changes happen. We've also seen pay parity recently, which is really incredible, and more opportunities and visibility of para-athletes as well, which is incredible. Mm. You just mentioned using your voice to talk about, yep. you know, come out and talk about it more. Me, I'll throw to you. When did you decide, when you're going through your relationship and the domestic violence, mm -hmm. and then afterwards coming through that, when did you decide <coughs> that you were going to talk about it and did you actually talk about it when it was going on? I when, decided when someone asked me, actually, last year. Do, we, how did they ask you? Was it in an interview, or was it a personal setting or like an interview setting? It was more like an interview setting. Yeah. So I was, that, that's where I was like really Throwing uncomfortable. Off. Like mm. I was thrown off like, mm. Mm, okay, wait, I need, I need time to think about this. And so I thought about it. I went home and I actually looked at my own daughter She's 14, and I looked at her, and I was like, I want to change the narrative for our children, because what I've been through, I don't want to see my daughter go through that. So I need to use my voice, because I've been through it. Why am I hiding, and why am I being ashamed, and living, allowing that abuser to take control of my life, mm. and why don't I speak? and be a role model for my daughter and then also other females and males, because males go through it too. You know, males, other females abuse other males and they still stay silent too because a woman can be just as intimidating as a man as well. And so like, I wanted to be that role model and I wanted to change that narrative and normalise that abuse and stop letting it be a shameful thing because I spoke to one person when I was going through it and they kind of just looked at me like, well, that's your fault. So that's where I shut down and I didn't want to speak. So then as I grew older and probably last year, I realised like if I speak to multiple people, then I stop that abuser from taking control of my life because out of that like 10 people, one or two people will come out and help me and support me and guide me through the which way to go. Yeah. So I wanted to change that and I wanted to make sure, use my voice, because I know there's so many females and males that are going through domestic violence and it's because a lot of them don't want to come out because when I was probably like 20, I was like, I wish I heard somebody. I wish someone spoke to me to normalise it or I wish I just heard it on the radio. So I thought, okay, why don't I make that change, make a difference, New, use my story to help other females, other males to be strong, confident and get their life back on track. And that's what I wanted. I wanted to change that narrative because there's so many people that just look at like abuse like, oh, that's your own fault. No, mm. because we don't know. We just stay stuck in it because we, we're ashamed and we're scared and we don't want to come out because we're scared because out the abuser has threatened us and said, if you go to this person, or you go and tell the police, or I'm going to kill your family, or I'm going to, you know, so that builds fear, fear in us, and it shuts us down. So that's why I, we would never, I would never speak. 
So that's why now, using my story, I want to help other women and males get their life back on track and just feel confident. In terms of, Lydia, in terms of encouraging women, you're a mountaineer, and you, you obviously want to encourage other women to be climbers or mountains, but it's, it's not just that. It's wider than that, isn't it? It's about just getting out there. It is. It's, just, it's about engaging, uh, engaging with the environment, whether it's actually consciously deciding you remember where you put your car keys, <laughs> but, and, <laughs> but more. In, instead of being so taken up by what is happening before or after, that being engaged for the present. And more of it for me is having people value big nature. So uh, I'm a mountain guide and the best beginner clients I could have are people who've done not, not, not anything in the mountains, of course, but say big ocean sailing or surfing or not necessarily to do with water, but horse riding where there is consequence. And we always think as people that consequence is a negative term, mm. but consequence is a positive term. Look, the consequence of, cha- of training become a champions, you know, or you get consequence of studying, you, become, you get a degree or a trade. So we are animals designed to do this. And so my message is always quite sort of basic. They're like just engage, just go and learn, just go and grow and embrace big nature. You've also since gone up to Everest another five times, so it wasn't just that one time. (laughs) (laughs) Once wasn't enough. (laughs) Uh, I have, I've, uh, so I've summited Everest six times out of six, well, seven attempts, but one attempt wasn't an attempt because they had this big avalanche where 16 people were killed, not on our expedition, but um, and the whole expedition was closed down. Uh, but I have gone back as a mountain guide. So I, one other woman and I guided Everest for the first time successfully and um, became the first woman to guide Everest. And I've guided it more than any other woman in the world. And quite a few people have climbed it quite a lot, but they've been sponsored to climb. So I'm really proud of that. And then the young the young <laughs> um, mountain guide women are coming through, so now I'm sort of the grandmama. <laughs> yeah, um, but what else were you well, doing? But someone, but someone could look at your CV and go, oh, you're, you, you're an elite athlete and you always have been, but you were actually really bad at sports. I was super bad at sports. <laughs> you guys don't even know. No, no, seriously. No, seriously. I used to dread sports days so much that the cloud of doom, <laughs> the cloud of doom was the sports day at primary school, don't laugh, um, and it was out there three months out, and it would be getting closer every day. And you, just Wednesday afternoons, you know, sports afternoons, terrifying failure, failure, loser, dork, geek. Walk, I was always teased for walking funny, Etc. So I think, you know, there's always, it's always really important to know that uh, you may look at an elite athlete, but they didn't start necessarily as an elite athlete mm. or even that good. I just found a sport that suited me. Stomp, 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 stomp. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> I won't walk, I'll climb. Yeah. <laughs> um, Holly, I want to come back to you talking about elite sports. Mm. Uh, you said before there's pay parity now, but yep. it's still very much... There's a lot of aspects of it that's self-funded. Yep, right? yes, and same, absolutely. And same with you, Mia, a lot of self-funding. Do you see... How... Can you see a world where that can change and how can that change? Yeah, so for my own sport and every sport in New Zealand is quite different in terms of their funding model. So we do get some funding through high performance sport, but I also have um, two jobs as well through Drug Free Sport New Zealand and Athletics New Zealand, uh, just to make some ends meet there. And so I need these jobs, one for me as a person because I like to do other things. I love the education space and I love having that influence there and working with um, other individuals in pursuit of their dreams. Mm -hmm. But I also need it to make me or help me get to those big events. So I've just been over in Paris. That event was partially self-funded as well. 
very fortunate to get sponsors on board, but yeah, some of it um, and majority of it does come out of my own pocket. So I do have to think about how do I how do I get there and, and what do I need for that. Um, and lots of different sports. I think we were talking before yeah. um, about your sport. What, what's your deal in your sport? Yeah, it's so, uh, like, yeah, we have to come up with our own. Yeah. So, like, yeah, I've got two jobs too. Yeah, so well, it's, it's crazy, two, right? It's crazy. Yeah. yeah. And I think um, you probably agree. A lot of people see us on the big stage and think we just That's get your there. Full -time it's a yeah. full-time yeah. job. Yeah. But yeah. it's not, you know, and we have to work hard to get to those places and we have mm. to spend a lot of our money to get there. Um, yeah. But hopefully that will change and I think the voice um, of some of our wahinis and our strong female leaders is important in that change. I've, I'll go to a more generic question now and I'll throw this out to all three of you. What's the best piece of advice you've ever been given? Uh, the best advice I've been given is don't change who you are. Yeah. yeah. Be yourself and if people don't like it, then that's their choice. Yeah. But you go and fight and be yourself. And don't and be proud of the small things. Yeah. yeah. Be proud of the little things because it's the little things that will make us get to the big things. Yeah, nice. Uh, mine is along the same lines. I have had two coaches in my career. Uh, Danny Spark, who's from Greymouth on the West Coast where I grew up, and he said to me when I was younger, be authentically you. Yeah. You know, and yeah. that has always stayed with me. So when I have doubts and when I think maybe this isn't for me, I go, this is what he said to me, be authentically you. Don't let other people take you from your path or your goals. Work hard for what you want to achieve and be the person that you want to achieve. So that was probably one of the best pieces of advice. Yeah. Because that's what keeps pushing us, eh? A hundred percent. A hundred percent. And it may not be the very best piece of advice, but the one that comes to my mind is to be... Um, always to remain curious and always to be curious. And I've actually been criticised. You're always saying why. You're always saying why. <laughs> and if you say why, then you can find out that sometimes there isn't a reason. Mm. But also you can find out how things work. <laughs> That's a cool one. So being curious, it opens doors. You know, how do you live? How do you think? That's what you were curious about your son. Mm. And, and so it works in lots of ways. I think that's one of the most precious pieces. Mm -hmm. Great answer. And all three of you are very strong, you know, capable women, but who are the women that you look up to and you, and you admire and why? Ooh. I strongly believe that as you pass through life, you will get... You will adopt and then you know, move on from different role models. And for me, very much, I have role models who are like 30 years younger than me. You know, they they just have a peace of mind, or they uh, old souls, or they are just really gracious in something where I'm a little bit harsh, for example. So I think that um, for me, it's an ever changing, mm -hmm. and that people, that, that I always advise that your role model could be much younger. It doesn't have to be a mentor that's a lot older than you. Mm. Yeah. yeah. I think for me, um, one person that comes to mind is my grandmother, because she's had a huge impact in my life, uh, particularly my sporting career as well. Mm. So I grew up on the West Coast, like I've mentioned, um, and along the West Coast, we don't have a track whatsoever. So a lot of my javelin training was done on any concrete that I could find. And then when we went to our holiday house, which is in a wee place called Okarito, which is near Franz Joseph, my granddad would get the hand mower out and mow a wee strip in the hay field. <laughs> oh. And that was my javelin runway. That's, you know, that's what we did. We made do with what we had to get to where we wanted to go. But my grandmother, she was always there to help fundraise for sports um, events. She still sits at the Hokitika New World doing a fundraiser, like a oh. raffle. Oh. Every time I want to go away, she oh. sits there and makes all these little oh. cards for me so that I can get to where I need to get. But I think her dedication and my dreams was really important to me and um, something that I'm hugely grateful for. Mm. And the way that she lived her life and raised her family was something I truly admire. Mm. Oh, mine will have to be my daughter. She's 14, and every day she always encourages me and tells me, Mum, you're doing a great job, every day. And she gives her authentic love and just shows me that she's proud of me no matter what I do. So, yeah, my daughter's my role model. Yeah. That's awesome. 
What's the, and for all three of you, what's the piece of advice you'd give to your younger self to help them thrive as a wahine in this world? It'll be all right in the end, <laughs> honest. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah, that last bit I said, yeah. actually. Yeah. yeah. That was a good one, <laughs> nice and short. <laughs> um, I would be, if, if I was a younger self, I would say enjoy enjoy life. Yeah. Enjoy being that age, enjoy being young. Make the most of it because... Once you grow up, you can't go back down. <laughs> you can only go back up. So you just get older and older. And don't limit yourself, you know? Yeah. One thing I hate is, this is the biggest thing about me, I don't like people telling me my age. Like, they limit and say, oh, you, but you're 33 years old. And I'm like, no, nah, no, nah, I'm 33 years old. doesn't matter. Don't put an age on me because I can do what 16-year-olds can do and I can probably do it better. So I always say age is just a number. Don't be afraid, doesn't matter how old you are or how young you are, go and give it a go. Like, don't mm. be afraid to fight and give it a go. And just enjoy it, enjoy it, enjoy the moment. Live in the now, don't live in the past. You know, let, let it, you know, the past is what made you and shaped you, but now you're living in the now and you're a new, you're a new person. Carry on being you, don't let anyone change you. Yeah. Yeah. No, I love that. Um, I think for me, it would be stick to your own path. Um, I've had a lot of people judge me from missing my arm, and I always actually remember my um, a PE teacher I had when I was young, and he was new, and he came to the PE class, and he said, oh, you can't play basketball, and sat me at the side. And, oh. you know, I wasn't, I wasn't old enough or um, confident enough to say, hey, dude, that's not all good. Um, so I would say to myself, stick to your own path, um, learn, learn from those challenges you'll face and use your voice to, to change that perspective so no other little girl, a little boy gets sat on the side like I was during my PE class. Yeah. That's sad. Okay. I know. Cool. <laughs> well, thank you so much and thank you for all that insight and sharing you know, so much about your personal lives. That's actually in the end of the session now and we just show appreciation again. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.